Bryce, good afternoon. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm great. Um, so I know you're back from some travels in the Philippines, I believe. I did. I just got back Friday morning from a two-week trip there. All right. And as we were chatting a little bit, hot, hot, hot. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny. We're in the midst of a heat wave here in Los Angeles, and uh, Philippines seems to always be in a heat wave, but you, know, you get to add to it the, uh, the pleasure of humidity. So it was, uh, it was a hot and sticky trip, to say the least. And they can compete with us on traffic, correct? Oh, yeah. It's even worse. I say, you know, I, I joke with people that, that that Manila tends to take all the things you hate about living in Los Angeles and just sort of dial it up 10x. Um, and that's definitely true of the heat. And it's also true of the traffic. I, uh, I've i learned um, to not get agitated. I've, I've, I have given up um, and and sort of surrendered. And what it requires is an iPad or a newspaper or uh, email to work on um, while, while you're being sort of driven through the streets of, of Manila. Um, although at times I feel like when I'm, I'm getting being driven through through the streets that I'd probably actually be be faster moving on foot. Um, so if it wasn't so so hot outside, I probably would would walk around a lot more. I've done that in New York City. Yeah. The opposite. It was freezing, and I got there faster walking than driving. Well, I, li- I lived in New York too. I mean, you know, I think the funniest thing about New York City is that it's it's often way faster taking the subway than it is taking a t- taking a cab, and sometimes even faster walking. Um, so yes. it's interesting. Yeah, it was good. it was great exercise. So. Now tell us when, tell us who you are and what you do. Yeah, so uh, I'm a co-founder and CEO of a company called Task Us, and we do ridiculously good outsourcing. And what that means is we support rapidly growing businesses to outsource customer care and back office functions. So startup businesses, companies like Tinder, Uber, Whisper, use Task Us. Uh, to scale out these operations, you know, we were, we're in a, a really interesting time in history where businesses that are worth billions of dollars are being created in the course of a few years. And um, it's just it's so exciting. But, you know, you need to lay the, the foundation for successful future growth. And Task Us is a real key part of that. So today we've got 1,200 full time staff in our offices in the Philippines. We've got two offices that we own and operate there uh, and a team of consultants here in our offices in Santa Monica, California who work with our clients to build teams in those offices in the Philippines uh, to really scale out their operations. And unlike other outsourcing companies where there's this sort of cost culture trade-off, Taskus is built exactly like a Silicon Valley startup. And so the, the quality of work that we deliver um, is on par with that of, of these startups. So we, we go to startups and say, listen, you can cut your costs in half. You can build a very scalable process. And you also can maintain the quality that you've become known for and the, the sort of cultural nuances of what your business really stands for. Um, and there's no longer that compromise that, that, that they've had to face in the, in the past with other traditional BPO businesses. Not to mention they can focus on what they should be focusing on. Yeah, you know, one of my favorite uh, things about outsourcing or just talking about this topic is that um, – that there's a there's a quote from uh, Barack Obama uh, in a Vanity Fair article, and he talks about uh, the suits that he wears. He says, "I only have two types of suits: gray suits and blue suits." And and when pressed uh, as to why that was, it was to reduce the number of decisions he had to make in a given day. Um, and you think about that. You think about the number of major decisions that the president has to make. You know, he doesn't want the responsibility for deciding what he wears, even deciding what he eats. He he, he delegates that decision. And I think. Um, um, what we're doing is, is, is very similar, where it's taking uh, functions of a business that uh, require large amounts of people, um, but would be uh, a distraction potentially for, for some of these more agile headquarters. So, you know, the new business, I think the modern business looks like a lot lighter, more focused organization. Um, and some of the companies that are being built today are just tremendous examples of that. Really, you know, properly utilizing both their their financial capital and their intellectual capital, um, so that they're building best-in-class product and keeping a, a tight internal team uh, focused on on really creating incredible products. Well, it's, it's very interesting because we, you know, well, this is all part of a leadership series we're doing, and um, I'm going to combine maybe a couple of questions here. Um, you know, what your perspective of leadership is, but especially in the sense of you've got you've got an ability to be a leader for a com- for management of other companies, yep. um, leading in a lot of different ways. And and these companies um, or, or again, the, the company can't be a leader. The management in those companies also have to lead in in bringing you on and being synergistic and creating right. a strong team, et cetera, et, right. et cetera. So how do you define how all this leadership, what this leadership is and how it works? 
Yeah, I mean, to me, uh, I think effective leadership is best exemplified. There's this, it's a, kind of a corny photo, probably been overused, but there's a, there's this uh, bo- a picture of a boss, which is like a, a stick figure sitting behind a desk being dragged along by four or five men who are sort of pulling it along with a rope. And that's the representation of a boss. Um, but the representation of the leader is uh, the guy out front, right? There's nobody sitting behind the desk. The, the leader's at the front of the line dragging this desk along with, with all of uh, the, the, the other employees. Um, and I think that's, that's probably, the, to me, the, the greatest uh, way to capture what it really means to be a leader. To me, a leader is willing to roll up their sleeves um, and dive headfirst into the nitty gritty, right? Uh, no task is too small. I think, it, you know, sometimes people hear this and they think that, okay, well, that means as a leader that you should be doing small tasks on a daily basis. And that's not what I mean. Uh, what I mean is that you have to be humble enough that if there's a piece of trash on the floor, you pick it up yourself, right? Or if, um, you know, we, we have uh, a company car in the Philippines um, and very often, um, I mean, almost all the time when I'm in the Philippines, I don't get to take the company car. And the reason is because there's more important things, right? I mean, I'm the CEO of the business, but if there's two or three or, you know, some cases five people who need a ride in that van, um, then they get the van and I get to take, uh, you know, take a little <laughs> Philippines taxi. Although the Philippines just got Uber, thank God, because the taxi service there is really uh, quite, quite grim. They, 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 like, you know, everyone's preserving gasoline so they don't turn on the, uh, the AC which in that kind of heat is um, pretty unbearable, <laughs> particularly with the traffic. But anyhow, um, but so that, that to me is an example of leadership is, you know, willing to sacrifice, willing to always think to yourself, not what's best for me, but what's best for the organization. And, and very often that means delegating, you know, pushing tasks down. Um, but all, it also uh, very often means being willing to sacrifice um, into personally. And, and, and I don't think there are many people um, these days, and, you know, myself included, I struggle with this, who... Uh, can really say that they're willing to put the organization before themselves. Yeah, it, it's, you know, I compare a lot of things to sports and, um, you know, to, to me it's like the, you know, the Mark Messier, if you will, in hockey who, yeah. who says, you know, we're going to go out to win and he scores two goals and it gets other people to score just as many or stop goals or, or take a hit, you know, or whatever. Um, in, in the business world, what I hear a lot of, and I, I would think with your the, the business you've got, how valuable it is for, for companies, um, trust becomes paramount in leadership here because they have to trust you. You're representing so much of their business by what you do. That's true. Uh, it's, it's, it is a, um, it's a marriage of sorts, and it definitely takes some getting, getting to know one another. Uh, and it's not always easy. I mean, I like to say that you know, as, as the CEO, I'm the, I'm the, sometimes I'm the complaint executive officer, uh, which means that, you know, when something goes wrong, uh, clients will very often call me directly or email me directly. Um, and that's the, that's part of the responsibility, um, of, of the business. And it's also, I think, part of getting to know one another. I mean, one of the things we, we say to people, uh, who will start using our services initially is this is going to be harder uh, than doing it yourself for the first three to six months. Um, but that's not the reason you're doing it. You're doing it because after that, it's going to get a lot easier, right? After that, you're not going to have to think about it. So you have to be willing to invest both time and money in those initial phases to be successful in an outsourced relationship. Um, so we, we, we definitely uh, have, have, have seen um, a lot of times where in those early days, there is some question around, God, is this going to work? You know, did we pick the right team? These guys aren't getting it. Um, and so very often I'll kind of see the same, same uh, few steps that clients will go through where they come in very high expectations. This is going to solve everything, even though we've told them, listen, it's going to take a while. Um, and then you're a few weeks in and I'm getting a phone call and why is this taking so long? Why aren't we, you know, why aren't, why haven't we hired our team yet? Why are things taking longer than we expected? These, the quality isn't there, what have you. Um, and, you know, lo and behold, every single time, a few more months into the process, things, things turn around. Um, and so I do think it requires uh, a confidence and being willing to look your client in the eye and say, hey, we're going to get there. It's going to take a little bit of time, but we're going to make it. Um, but the only way you can really say that is if you truly believe it, right? If you truly know that when you tell your client things are going to improve, that you mean it because you've done it time and time again. And so experience, I think, becomes really, really important, uh, being willing to, to, to uh, have the confidence that you'll be able to back your word up. Yeah, you know, um, there's a 
great uh, line that Peter Drucker used, and I, I, I recall it every so often someone else brings it up. It's, uh, yeah. You know, and you probably know it, culture uh, eats strategy for breakfast. Yeah. And yeah. so creating a winning culture, whether it's on a sports team or in a business, um, is critical. And I find it fascinating because in a way, a lot of businesses, they have to create a winning culture within their walls. You have to create a winning culture within your walls and the walls of your client at the same time. Because you're more than just a vendor, you're actually part of them. Yeah, absolutely. No, you know, I think this is one of the conflicts we deal with a lot inside of our business, which is what is the task us culture and, and where does our culture end and our client culture begin? And we've, we've succeeded at, at, at being able to um, really master our clients' cultures largely by focusing in on a particular client type, right, which is fast growing startup businesses. Now, obviously, you know, if you look at, at these companies, their cultures aren't exactly the same, but there are very similar traits, right? They really care about people. They care about quality customer service. Um, you know, they, 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 they really want to ensure that the consumer experience is world class and they use that as a competitive advantage against entrenched large competitors who maybe can't move as quickly. And so those are the common types of our clients and, and that become, has become the sort of task us culture. Um, but it, it is, it's an interesting dichotomy where you're, you're kind of having to, to, to play two roles. Um, another thing that's really interesting we find is if you have a a teammate who's working on one campaign and gets promoted and is now working for a different client that that can lead to some confusion and uh, and having to sort of realign expectations um so that certainly is uh it certainly is, is an interesting part of the business yeah the um man you're just leading to so many more questions i could ask um <laughs> but um i'll go back i'll go back to one and then I, before i forget and then i'll come back to this part you're talking about um why did you create task us in the first place yeah, so we, I was an investment banker when I graduated from uh, from college. I, w I went to work. Uh, I was living in New York. I went to NYU, um, and I graduated a year early and kind of took a step back and said, I want to stay in New York City. Uh, the only way I'm going to be able to do that is get a job where I can afford life in New York City, uh, and so finance seemed like the appropriate path. I did that for, for, for about a year and a half, and um, in that time, uh, found myself really frustrated. In the first few months, I was very excited, but after, you know, maybe the first half year, I, I, I was consistently frustrated by the the complexity or lack thereof on the type of work that I was doing. So I, I, I kind of got to this point where initially I was really angry and frustrated that oh, this work is so far beneath me. I've got a college degree. How could they have us me doing data entry? You know, like classic 22 year old uh, self entitled uh, stuff. Um, and then as I began to sort of accept that that was the way it was going to be, I, I thought about it from the opposite perspective, which was, you know, the shareholders were paying me uh, a pretty expensive wage to do work that could have easily been done uh, by somebody in India or in the Philippines or uh, another country uh, for far, far less. Um, and that was the thesis that led to task us when we started the business it was a virtual assistant company so the the model was different we we were looking to build a network of virtual assistants these were people who were working from their homes college kids in pakistan you know uh you know, working mothers in in the midwest um it, all, all sorts of different types of people and we would basically have them in our network and whenever we got a task in we would assign it to the best person in the world who was suited to do that task. So a call, uh, you know, the, the mother in the Midwest might do a calling task. The, the kids in Pakistan might, might do a, a data entry task uh, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and it was an interesting model. It, 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 it got over the need to hire someone full time. I mean, at the, at the time, the only other virtual assistant businesses that existed uh, required you to hire someone either part time or full time. So you had to commit to 10 hours or 20 hours or 40 hours a week, which we didn't think gave busy professionals, the type of flexibility you needed when, you know, sometimes you have a five hour project, other times you had nothing yeah. that you needed done. Um, so we solved for that. But the one thing we didn't solve for was actually making any money. Um, <laughs> at the time I was, you know, it, it, my business partner, Jasper, and myself had started this business and we were 22 years old living at our parents' house and flash forward three years, we're 25 years old, still living at our parents' <laughs> house, uh, you know, never giving up on the dream. Um, and uh, I think what, what, what happened was, uh, reality kind of hit us straight in the face uh, at that point, and we we were desperately looking for a way to turn this into something that could could make money. Um, and the thing that made the most sense was helping out uh, 
our friends who were way more successful than us. So we had a lot of friends who had built startups that were growing quickly and had gone from, you know, the two co-founders to 20 employees. Um, and when we kind of dug in on what some of those employees were doing, we found that it was a lot of it was wasted time, right? A lot of it was very good. Went back to sort of that that uh, time that I spent in investment banking doing data entry. Um, and so we went to our friends and said, hey, you know, we can do this for you for for half of what you're paying today. Um, and they were interested. A lot of them were hesitant that they were going to have to get rid of their, you know, these employees. And we said, no, 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 you don't need to get rid of anyone. You're growing so quickly. Just repurpose them, right? Instead of having them do simple email uh, responses, have them do the complex email responses. Right. Instead of having them do uh, content moderation, have them, you know, ma manage process. Instead of having them do, you know, simple uh, photo retouching, have them do your graphic design work. Um, and lo and behold, that's what's happened in most of the cases for us. You know, most of the time that Taskus comes into a company, we aren't uh, we aren't replacing jobs, right? We're we're freeing people up to do uh, higher skilled work. Uh, it's not always the case, but more often than not, our companies are growing at such a rapid clip uh, that we're just basically augmenting the the current in house workforce and helping it to be more focused. So you know, when you um you talk about the cultures and 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 whatnot of uh, yourself, your client. And then there's different stages as you're going to grow and your clients are going to grow. There's going to be different stages. Um, sports teams, for example, they know the best athletes. They're interviewing for character and right fit and everything at that yeah, point. Yeah. So yeah. I'm assuming you're doing the kind of the same thing where you're looking for two words that we use a lot in our business, the right fit, as much if not more sure. than, the, than the qualifications. You know what's amazing, Mark, is that we we hire like crazy. I mean, there are months this year where we hired over 200 people uh, in our offices in the Philippines, and um, our our uh, acceptance rate is incredibly low. I mean, in the single digits, sometimes in the low single digits. So you have to be interviewing thousands of people every single month. Um, so we've really done a lot of work on perfecting that process. Um, we've got uh, tests that people can take both in office and online. Uh, to screen for basic skills. Um, once once they've been screened for, for sort of a, a basic competency, they go through an advanced skills test. Uh, and once they've got, gone through that advanced skill test, if, if we have a need for the type of skill set that they're demonstrating uh, in the testing process, then they'll go through an interview process. Um, so it's really, the, the interview process or the, the, the application process is built to be as efficient as possible um, and to identify top talent. Um, and once they go through the interview process, they're profiled for an individual client. Um, and at that point, the, the manager on that account will, will then interview them and, and decide who's going to be brought on and who's not. Um, but recruiting in, is, is one of the biggest parts of our business. Uh, if you think about it, I mean, we just constantly are having to hire people uh, to keep pace with the growth. Well, you know what, I, what we found, um, call it back office operations or call centers or whatnot that we worked uh, mostly ourselves, mostly higher level. But in talking about that level is that... Um, They've, to distinguish and differentiate yourself, a lot of times you've got to be almost making more of a career than just, you know, this is how much money you're making, but you'll you'll leave if someone else gives you a dollar more per hour or something, that type of deal. Totally true. Totally true. I mean, the, the, the attrition rate in the call center industry is astronomical, yeah. right? I mean, I can only speak to the, the rates in the Philippines because we don't have uh, operations in the United States at this point. But, you know, you, you, you hear numbers like 60 to 80 percent a year. Uh, and that's what they report. People, you know, off the record will talk about things north of 100 percent right. a year, which is just insane. Yeah. Um, how you can manage a business like that, uh, to me, it makes absolutely no sense because, you know, basically you just have this this constant brain drain where you're training people up there. And very often people will come in, they'll earn a fee to go through training and then right before they're going to actually launch on a client campaign they'll walk out of the door and go somewhere else and, and earn another training fee so at task us uh, we've done two things to combat this um, the first is culture right i mean we've got a culture like i said that is unique uh, to any other call center in the philippines um, and we really walk the walk when it when it comes to this i mean one of the things that every person in this business including myself does is spend a lot of time in our offices in the Philippines. I mean, I was there for the last two weeks. I, I go somewhere between, you know, eight and nine times a year these mm -hmm. days. Um, and when I'm in the Philippines, we're in the office. I'm working nights. Uh, we're, we're sitting down with teammates who've just been 
hired, listening to them, hearing their complaints about, you know, the different things that we could improve in the office. Some of the things we are able to improve, some of the things we're not. And one of the things I really pride myself on is always giving straight answers. If it's, you know, hey, boss, we'd like to get a bigger bonus this year and we don't have the budget for it, I'll tell them straight up. It's not going to happen because we don't have the budget for it. Um, to me, that trust that, that, that we've developed with the teammates who work for us in the Philippines is a huge part of our culture. Um, they know that we're always going to give it to them straight. And as a result, they, they, they behave accordingly, right? Well, one thing the, you're uh, doing the there, if I can interrupt, you're, um, you're branding yourself yeah. as a uh, trustworthy place to work. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I think that's. Pr I mean, it sounds. It actually sounds pretty simple when you're when you're maybe a Western business or a startup. But like when you actually when you're when you're talking about other businesses in in a place like the Philippines, a developing country, um, there's a lot of people uh, who have uh, burned uh, employees in a in a major way, and and a, 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 as as a result, there is an attitude of of mistrust and and look for uh, a great degree of sort of employee security. And so we pride ourselves in giving our employees that. We pride ourselves in providing private health insurance for every single one of our 1,200 employees in the Philippines. We pride ourselves on the fact that we have a scholarship program where if you're an employee for a year or more, you can have one of your kids' uh, private school tuition paid for fully by the company. Um, doing things like that uh, and really doing them, not just talking about them, but actually giving them to your employees and giving them to your employees consistently uh, is one of the parts of our culture. The other part, which I think is just important is, is, is you know, maybe sounds really, really simple is we flipped the notion on its head of traditionally in, in, in the Philippines uh, and in, in most metropolitan areas, you've got a center of the city, right? So there in, in the Philippines, there's a place called Makati and there's a place called the fort. And this is kind of where everybody comes in. But in, in a city with the type of traffic that Manila has, sometimes people have commutes that are two or three hours each way. And these people don't have cars. Most of them are driving uh, in the back of a bus or in the back of a jeepney, which is an open air Jeep um, with no air conditioning. Uh, and that's how they get to and from work. And so what we've done is we've gone out into the suburbs where people live, close to where people live, and built our offices. Uh, so our biggest office is in a place called Imus Cavite, and it's the only office within 10 kilometers. Um, and so a lot of the people who work for us, they used to commute an hour and a half, two hours into the center of Manila, and we've effectively given them back three to four hours of their life, which now they can spend with their okay. family or relaxing or maybe actually getting enough sleep. You know what we call that? Um, and as a result... We call that talent yeah. and wellness. Yeah, exactly, right? And 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 it's like people people talk about it as, oh, God, isn't that inconvenient for your clients to have to go out there? And I'm like, you know what? I would much rather inconvenience my clients than inconvenience my people. Because when I have an attrition rate of about 30%, which to me is high, but relative to the industry is super low, uh, I know that I'm going to retain client build business purely on the fact that we deliver. Well, you ever hear of service. Jack Ma and Alibaba? His yeah, mo motto go. is, he's not necessarily the first one that thought about it, but it's uh, the shareholders are number three, the employees are number one, and the customers are number two. And if the yep. number one and there two work, go. guess what? The shareholders will probably get theirs too. So, yeah, so we're going to continue this so on true. part two. Hang on one second.